Okay, so now we're going to talk about the, what should be, at this point, a very simple change of, of names. We're going to talk about the tangent and cotangent spaces. And, of course, we are now beginning, since we're now talking about space-time routinely, we're beginning with our coordinate system, which is a new place to start, right? We used to start by building vector spaces, but now we're starting by building coordinate systems in space-time. And the reason is, is this is actually, the idea of the coordinate system is going to be sort of a foundational concept in general relativity, so now it's a good idea that we begin with it. And, of course, all the points in space-time have names, and those names are always given by coordinates. In fact, one of the ways you can write this down is, say, x mu of q would represent the coordinates at the point q. x mu of p would represent the coordinates at the point p. Things of that, things like that, and we've decided also that you know we can abbreviate this with just x of q if we wanted to, and just x of p because this index here is not really the same kind of index as we've had on our on our um, vector spaces because it's these are not vectors x it's just a coordinate labeling all the points in space time. What we're going to do is we're going to make a bit of a change that the vector space which we would put at a point p. We're now going to give it a name. We're going to call it the tangent space, and we're going to call it TP. And the covector space, which would exist at, co at uh, point P, we're going to call the cotangent space. Everything else is the same. It's just the name is, is, di is different. But now when we talk about the tangent space, that automatically elicits the fact that the basis at that, of that vector space, the tangent space, are the differential operators, the, the basis, the four basis differential operators, and the basis of the cotangent space are, and I don't think I named this the last time, these are one forms. The idea of a form in general relativity is something we haven't really discussed too much. But these operators, these uh, uh, maps, right, these, these maps that take del mu to the real numbers or take vectors to the real numbers, these maps happen to be called one forms, and we'll use that language from now on. And you can build two forms and three forms and higher forms from one forms, but it's not completely obvious how to do it, and we won't discuss that for a few more lectures. But uh, regardless, it's all still the same rules apply that um, we had before, which is that the one forms are maps that take the, the vectors to the real numbers. Oh, I should make this... Uh, I should make this a new so I can do it correctly. I gotta shrink that eraser too. And so this is the same rules we've always used. And um, but now we're going to call this the tangent space and this the cotangent space. And every point at space-time has its own tangent space and its own cotangent space. And it has all of its own uh, tensor product spaces, right? that all exist at every single point in space-time. And now the reason we use this word tangent and cotangent, of course, well, I keep saying of course, but it's not, nothing of the here is particularly obvious, is that the vectors that are members of the tangent space, right, are these differential operators, and they very well, they do a good job of expressing tangency, because that's what derivatives do in a lot of ways. So we speculate that on the existence of a function on space-time, which I'll just write this way, and an element, say a differential operator that is an element of the tangent space, which can be expressed as a mu del mu, when that operator acts on one of these arbitrary functions, we're basically getting the directional derivative of this function right, because this is a function of x, of the space-time, this, this differential op operator, th which is this thing here, b basically gives us a directional derivative in a certain direction uh, in, the um, in the coordinate system. Right? And Because remember, this is, this is a uh, function of uh, del mu. This is a function phi of x0, x1, x2 and x3. So this whole thing is a directional derivative and the reason this 
works for every separate point in space-time is we evaluate it at each relevant point. In this case, since we're dealing with the, the, the tangent space at P, we evaluate this directional derivative at P. And it's important to understand that, otherwise this kind of looks like a bit of a cop-out where all we've done is rename E mu, we've renamed that to del mu, but we're not just renaming it, we're actually applying some uh, re mathematical realization that's very useful. Because if, for example, say we took phi and I made it x0 squared plus sine of x3. I, I'm just, for, for whatever, uh, just picking, a, picking an example. And then say the vector, the, um, the linear operator that we're talking about, the linear operator that we're talking about that covers, uh, we're, we're going to talk about a vector field now, right? We're going to talk about a vector field that looks like this, that looks like um, just, how about just a simple vector field? D0 plus D del, um, uh, partial, partial 0 plus partial 3, right? That'll be the vector field, right, with uh, uh, constant coefficients throughout all of space-time, which means, of course, that A, um, A0 of X just equals 1 everywhere, and a3 of space-time equals 1 everywhere. So those, those two vector field functions are constant, and then we just simply put x0 squared plus sine x3. And of course, this derivative is going to be 2x0 plus cosine x3, right? Oops, am I putting that down? I don't know why I did that. Right? Now, this function is is um, everywhere in the sp in the space time every every place that function is going to represent this differential this differential operator here uh, acting on this function of space time it's all going to look like this the difference the difference is is that it's at, at point p this is evaluated at p at point Q, this is evaluated at Q. At point S, this is evaluated at S. And so when you do these evaluations, you get different numbers in each circumstance, which is why this, this choice of vector basis is not just swapping out E for... It's not just swapping out one symbol for another. It's actually this mathematical object gives you material that's really different results at each different point in space-time because it references a different set of coordinates. But what's interesting is everything here is tied to the coordinate system, right? If we, if we have, if, you know, if without a coordinate system, it doesn't make any sense. You have to have established your whatever four coordinates you want, whether they're cylindrical, polar, whether they're abstract, like the, I'm writing here, whether they're um, oblate spheroidal, it doesn't really matter how you chop up space-time, but one, you have to do that first so you can speculate about functions on space-time, in which case you can give a realization at each point using this basis of, of, of the, for the tangent space, using the differential operator basis, and for the cotangent space, using... Um, the basis of one forms. Okay, so um, with that in mind, now we have uh, learned. We have learned how to. How, we have learned how to establish um, an entire vector field, or a covector field, or a tangent, uh, a, a tensor field, at all throughout space time, and. We, so I'm no longer going to, to worry about drawing boxes saying, oh, you've got a tangent space, you've got a cotangent space, you've got a tensor product space at every single point in space-time. We, we just know that that's the case. And if I want to choose a, ve a vector field, I have to specify components that are functions of space-time, and I place it in the coordinate basis, and this will this will extract for me a vector at 
in the tangent space at every point in space time. If I want to do this for a cotangent, uh, I want to put a uh, covector at every point in space time, I do the same thing using the one forms. By the way, the one forms is still in the coordinate basis, right? The coordinate basis just means we're, we're referencing everything now to derivatives, uh, linear, uh, uh, we're referencing everything to these differential operators um, in the coordinate system. And so uh, this allows me to, to go to this, so I use this formula here, I can go, or I use this formula here, that means I can go to this point S, I can find a vector in that tangent space. Then I go to this point, I can find a vector in that tangent space. And I'm writing these as little arrows now, just to evoke, evoke the idea that I'm putting a vector at each, at each spot. But the arrows are actually not completely illogical because these are directional derivatives. That's what these linear operators are. They are directional derivatives. And so you, you can't, which is why we call this a tangent space to begin with. So um, uh, also so, uh, understand that I'm going to suppress the x, too. So this now is to be understood as a vector field where one vector is placed in every single one of these tangent spaces. So now, the, given that we have changed to this coordinate basis using these differential operators in one forms, you could ask, well, how do you change bases, right? Remember we had that whole long lecture about changing from e mu to the basis e mu prime, where I like to put the index of the new, um, of the new uh, uh, basis system on the index itself. But that isn't the only choice, and in a lot of books you'll see, you'll see e hat mu, or you'll see e um, uh, tilde mu. But I like to put the index on the um, actual, uh, uh, I like to put the, the prime on the actual index. But we used to do these kinds of transformations. How do we do that here? And there's two ways to do it. The first one we've already learned. I'm going to erase all this and start again. Okay, so now that we've established our tangent space, the concept of our tangent space and our cotangent space, and I want to understand now that when I write down tangent space and cotangent space, I'm talking about a field still. Even though I, I wrote down this point P, I want to understand that I'm talking about all of the points in space-time. So when I talk about the tangent space, I, I can talk about the tangent space at a point P. There's no doubt about it, and we will. But also I want you to understand what, we're talking about vector fields, and the tangent space is simply... You, an element of the tangent space is going to very frequently be, or usually mean, uh, a vector chosen in the tangent space at every point in space-time. All right. So, but we cannot get away from the fact that the tangent space is, is still a vector space, and just because we have established our favorite basis doesn't mean that we can't choose any four independent vectors in the tangent space as a basis. We've chosen the realization that all vectors are differential operators, and then we've singled out these differential operators as the ones we want to use as our basis. But we could have selected any collection of differential operators that are independent, and we could have established a basis that way. So I could have chosen, I could have chosen four differential operators, I'll call them L mu, and L mu would have been written in some form of a, some sort of matrix form like this, del mu. Well, this is the old basis. This is the transformation matrix that we talked about in a previous lecture. And this is the new basis. And this is, a, uh, this is the simple transformation, just like we did before, where this was e mu, and this was, I think, um, uh, oh, wait, should, first this mu should be alpha, sorry. This would be E alpha. And this is um, uh, uh, sort of E hat mu, right? This is just a different basis. There's nothing stopping us from doing that. And in fact, in intermediate general relativity, this is the basis of the subject of what we call frame fields. 
frame fields. Because remember, when we do this now, since this is, we're considering this as a field, meaning uh, a, a vec this, this thing exists at every point in space-time, we have, uh, this is referencing the vectors, the uh, basis vectors at every point in space-time. This thing, all of a sudden, has to be a function of space-time. This matrix is a, f all the matrix elements are a function of space-time in order to get the transformation right at each place. So you have to supply a lot more information. Because remember, every tangent space is independent from every other. So just because I make a transformation in one tangent space doesn't mean it affects every tangent space unless I have a rule that gives me a matrix for every single tangent space. And the only way I can have a matrix for every single tangent space is to make that matrix a function of space-time so that I put in the point and I get a matrix. So I need these matrices to be functions of space-time. And so everything becomes a field. Even the transformation is a field, in a sense, because it is a function of space-time. So that's the easy way to change the basis vectors of the tangent and the cotangent space. Um, the co of course, the cotangent space, their basis vectors change with the inverse, right? As we learned in the previous lecture. Everything is the same as the previous lecture. But funny thing, this isn't really the way we do it in the introductory part of general relativity. In general relativity, in the introductory part, we're focusing very strongly on this coordinate system. And the other way where the basis vectors of these spaces change is when you change the underlying coordinate system. If you change these lines from, from, from these lines that I've drawn here to, say, these lines, where I've got now red, and now I've, I've basically changed the coordinate system, well, certainly that means these basis vectors are suddenly going to be behaving differently as well. And that's the profound thing of general relativity, is everything's got to work no matter what coordinate system we choose for space-time. We could have any coordinate system in the universe here. We could have the red coordinates. We could have these green coordinates. Oh, I got all these colors. We could have these blue coordinates. But the underlying physics has to be the same. And when we change coordinates, we're basically going to change the directions that these elementary basic uh, derivatives move in, right? If x1 Went, went in this direction, and then x1 prime suddenly goes in that direction, well, then del1 here and del1 prime are going to behave differently on functions of the space-time. And, of course, the functions of the space-time are going to change when you change coordinates. They're going to go from phi of x to, say, phi prime of x prime, right? It's going to be a different function of different coordinates, but it better give you, at any point p, it better give you the same number, right? These two numbers, it better be equal uh, at a point p, because p doesn't give a damn what you call it. p doesn't care about its coordinate being x or x prime. p is a point in space, and it's behaving in a certain way according to the laws of nature, so if my laws of nature are dependent on some function of space-time, and I change the coordinates of space-time, well, I still better get the same answer. In fact, that very point I just mentioned is one of the most profound uh, uh, underpinnings of general relativity altogether. So let's see how that process works. All right, so let's see how this would work for an example. Well, not a very specific example, but let's see, understand how these coordinate transformations are going to work. We're going to start with our unprimed coordinate system. And I'll try to go with red here and I'll make the red the prime coordinate system. And I'm just symbolically showing sort of different directions just to imply that they are different systems. The important part to understand is what do we mean by a coordinate transformation, technically speaking, but it's a series of functions, right? It's a series of functions that tells us, actually I should put our primes in here, right? x1 or x mu prime, these are functions of the old coordinates. That means if I know the old coordinates, if I know the old coordinates, I have a function that'll give me the new coordinates. That's what a coordinate transformation actually is. And likewise, I should be able to write the old coordinates in terms of the new coordinates. 
just like that. So these are the coordinate transformations. And they're, as far as functions go, they're obviously the inverses of each other. And these are things that you are probably familiar with from uh, just changing from rectilinear to spherical polar to cylindrical coordinates. All sorts of coordinate transformations exist. And any two coordinate systems that can fully define a space-time can be... Uh, you've got to be able to transform between them. They're just relabeling of all the points. And that literally is all it is. It's just a relabeling of the names of these points. So instead of calling this a point... Well, I better do red over here. Instead of calling this a point P, you know, I could call that X mu prime of P, and these are the numbers that represent the point P. These are the four numbers that represent the point P in the coordinate system. I could name P, I can give you the numbers, I can attach the numbers to the name. This is all just about labeling the coordinates um, in, uh, in space-time. And likewise, I could do it for the old system or the new system. And also, calling old and new is sort of ridiculous because it's just different, right? It's just the first system and the second system or the second system and the first system. So, but once that's done, um, now we are going to talk about, well, we've organized space-time into a bunch of points, we're going to ultimately be making models in space-time that supposedly represent physics. So the way this is inevitably going to work is we're probably going to need functions on the space-time, right? We're going to need phi, which is a function of the, uh, uh, the first set of coordinates. And phi is going to tell us information of some sort, you know, that we're, we're talking about models in very gener big generality. Phi could be the strength of... A of an electric field, if I could be um, uh, some other kind of, of, of physical potential, who knows what, it could be density of material, it could be anything. But we're going to have to have lots of functions kind of like phi, that I tell you the point in space-time, and phi plug, turns that out and gives you some kind of real number, right? And could give you a complex number, or any other kind of number, by the way, but mostly in general, relatively, we're dealing with real numbers. So, in the new coordinate system, phi is going to be a different function, right? It's going to have to be phi prime of the new coordinates. But the same point P, let's say this, is, this point P is the same point in both systems. These two numbers better be the same for a given point P, right? As I said before. So, um, we want to now start thinking about, well, how do we write this function in terms of these coordinates, right? Let's erase this one for right now and not worry about it because it's completely symmetric. But it's very simple to do. You just use these transformations and you write phi of x mu, but that's a function of x mu prime, right? So now I've really got x mu prime in, then this function goes from the new coordinates to the old coordinates, and that's exactly what phi is looking for, and now phi uh, can give you your number. So this is a way of, exp of quickly expressing phi in terms of the new coordinates, and that makes perfect sense. It's a coordinate transformation. That's what it's for. So now we want to understand that, well, we have two coordinate systems, and this means that we have uh, the tangent space of all of the points in this coordinate system, we'll call that the tangent space. Um, this is the tangent space for, say, for, for all of these coordinate systems. This is, we'll call it TP, the tangent space there. And this is the tangent space in the prime coordinate system, right? Um, TP prime, say, right? It's the thing, it's the same tangent space, right? We're not changing the underlying space-time. We're just changing the coordinates. It's, it's, it's kind of silly. We, we wouldn't, this is not something we would ever do, actually, because, because we haven't really changed the tangent space. We've only changed the underlying coordinate system. We've changed the name of the point that the tangent space lives at, which is, a, which is the most trivial possible thing we could do. On the other hand, since the basis vectors are so intimately tied now with the coordinate system, the basis vectors here 
would be del mu, but here it would be something like del, I keep calling it del, but I, I mean I should say partial mu prime. Those are not the same basis vectors, but it's the same tangent space. So we know that these basis vectors and these basis vectors are related by a linear transformation. That means we definitely expect, just like we I showed briefly in the um, in the previous slide, we definitely expect a relationship that looks like this. Del mu prime equals del mu times some matrix lambda, right? And now the question is, is in the previous example, we can arbitrarily pick lambda because we can arbitrarily change basis vectors. And I've already kind of gone through doing that in the, uh, in the uh, a moment ago. But now we're asking a slightly different question. We're saying, well, hey, I'm changing the coordinate system. How does that, imp what implied change in the basis vectors does that mean? If I, if I, I want my basis vectors to always be these, these, these differential operators relative to the coordinate system, the coordinate variables. I always want that to be the case. So if I change my coordinate system, what lambda does this force us to choose to change, to express the new partial uh, derivatives in terms of the old partial derivatives? And that's the question that we're going to quickly look at right now. So what we'll start with is we'll go back to this expression really is sort of the heart of it. x mu, x mu prime. I'm going to look at this thing and I'm going to say I want to know how would a, the new coordinate uh, system's basis vectors act on this arbitrary function of space-time. And it's not too difficult. Uh, I would write the new basis system on phi. And remember, whenever I write phi, I mean this for right now, okay? It's going to equal uh, the old one, right? I'm going to use the chain rule, right? The old differential operator on phi multiplied by the, uh, the, the subsequent differential on the inside using the chain rule, which is dx mu dx mu prime, like that. And remember, dx mu, this thing right here, this is a function, right? So this whole thing is a logical derivative because this is a function of space-time through the coordinate transformation. x mu equals x mu function of x mu prime, meaning the old coordinates are a function of the new coordinates, right? The old coordinates are a function of the new coordinates, and that's what really goes in here. I, you know, just to keep it smooth, I, I don't put it in there, but I could, and then it's very clear that I can take these derivatives. And this thing here, that is the matrix lambda, which is going to be the linear transformation from one basis to another, just like we had e mu prime equaled a matrix lambda times e mu in the, in the original days. Well, we're going to have the same thing here, but now we've got our lambda, and the lambda isn't just some arbitrary thing we're choosing, it's actually driven by the coordinate transformation. Although I got to say, changing transformations of making coordinate transformations can also be completely arbitrary, right? That's one of the whole points of general relativity is you can arbitrarily change your coordinates. But this is a matrix, and the matrix it is, um, so, well, first, before I show which, how to sort of zero in on the matrix, let's clean this up, get rid of the phi's, because you don't really need the phi's, right? The, the, this is a differential operator, and so differential operators can equal other differential operators. And uh, dx mu, dx mu prime, like that. And this is the relationship where the, where the um, uh, lambda goes right there. Now remember also, <clears throat> where, where this is lambda, right? This is, this object right here is the uh, matrix, the linear transformation matrix between this this basis, the old basis, and the new basis, right? Um, let me go ahead. And, now, uh, the, the actual matrix itself would be dx0, dx0 prime, all the way to dx3, d 
dx3 prime, like that, right? That's the actual linear transformation. But what's important to understand is, remember, we're dealing with the space-time, right? So these basis vectors, they're very well defined at every single point once because we have this coordinate system that we're leaning on. So every single point has its, um, uh, its basis, but each point, this transformation is slightly different. And the reason it's different is because this thing here is a function of space-time. So lambda is actually a function of space-time. So every single point, these guys, this matrix, this matrix is actually a function of space-time, and every single point has its own slightly different transformation. Well, we hope it's slightly different because we hope everything happens smoothly. So uh, this is why everything is now thought of as vector fields and tensor fields. We're now, we're now talking about doing this process, this process of a basis transformation, not just in the tangent space at any one point, but in all the tangent spaces together. And to do that, well, we've already kind of solved this problem. These basis vectors, we understand that they're established at every point, and they're directional derivatives that um, will give us uh, uh, d typically different values when applied to these functions that exist on all, all space-time. But now the transformation itself turns out to be a matrix, but it's a matrix of functions, and the, those functions are these transformations of the coordinate system, right? These functions are these things, right? x mu, x mu prime, which are functions of space-time, and therefore the transformation matrix is a function of space-time. And so now we get a matrix for every single point, and in principle we can make a transformation, a basis transformation at every single point. And um, what's good for the vector space, the tangent space, is good for the cotangent space. And in the circumstance of the cotangent space, I would write, I would end up with this transformation. It's basically, the should be no surprise, but it is the inverse of the, um, it's the inverse of the transformation for the partials, right? So the, the basis in the tangent space went like, the, the transformation in the tangent space looked like this. Um, whoops. dx mu prime partial mu. So these are the two core transformations. The, uh, the cotangent basis vectors, the basis one forms, uh, will will use the inverse matrix, which is this thing, that the basis vectors do. And of course, that's because they transform in a different fashion. These things here are transforming contravariantly. These things are transforming covariantly. Why? Well, we defined anything that transforms like the basis vectors transform, transforms covariantly. Anything that transforms in the, using the inverse transforms contravariantly. So that's exactly what's happening here. These are the basis vectors of the tangent space, and therefore they transform by definition covariantly. And then when we do the analysis on the um, cotangent space, we discover, hey, those things use the inverse matrix, therefore they transform contravariantly. And now what's important to see is that this is where many general relativity textbooks start. They begin by saying, hey, you may have these things out there in the world called vector fields, and they just write them down like, like this, or they write them down like this. And they say, well, these vector fields here, if they transform using this rule, when I switch the coordinate system of my space-time, if these things transform this way, we're going to call them contravariant vectors. If these things transform this way, we're going to call them covariant vectors. And that's where they begin. I mean, that's like day one of many general relativity classes, and, and it's chapter one of many general relativity textbooks. And I've always found that a very confusing place to start because it looks, it seems so ad hoc to the student why that would be or, or what the foundation is. But now we kind of know we actually know a bunch of things that they never told us. First of all, these are the components 
of vectors, right? They're not writing down the actual basis vectors because they're missing these things, right? So they're not, they're, they've only got half the story. They're relying on the index gymnastics that they teach also in chapter one to keep all that straight, and they sort of hide this machinery, thinking it's more efficient to teach it without that. Um, I, it may be more efficient, but I don't think uh, it's I don't think it's a it's a good good trade off. So that's why I've kind of gone through these fifteen lectures. So that's the first problem, and then the second problem is, well, this is a this is supposed to represent a vector which normally is an element of a vector space, right? Well, you lose the actual vector. The only true vector is the, um, is the, is the basis vector, and then these are just the real numbers, uh, are just the components of the, the vector. So you're, you're losing the, the true sense of it being a vector, and, and that's missing too. So, and also the components transform the opposite way as a vector should. A vector actually should be the thing that's covariant. A, 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 a covector should be the thing that's contravariant. But we've got the components of vectors, so therefore we think of the components of vectors as contravariant when they're actually on the vector. And likewise, we think of the components of the one forms as being covariant even though they're on covectors. Co it's kind of a mess. But we've got it all straight. We're not worried about it because we understand what's going on. The key thing is, once we've decided that we're going to make a coordinate transformation, that will drive a transformation of the, the basis vectors in the tangent space and the basis vectors in the cotangent space. And when I say tangent space and cotangent space, I'm actually thinking of the entire field, the entire universe of, of all the tangent spaces and the cotangent spaces. And it's actually worth a while to, to mention something about that right now. There's a certain amount of formalism that we are indeed skipping. And it probably there's somebody out there just like me who's cringing about it because there's like, well, why aren't you talking about manifolds and fiber bundles? I mean, why are you going through all this? Oh, we're just putting coordinates down into space time and not talking about manifolds and talking about um, fiber bundles. And I suppose uh, they're right, but I mean, it's not a bad idea. But um, what I will say is this. We've got all of space-time, and we, we kind of all have got to agree that we can put down a coordinate system on space-time. The entire space-time is... We will, is technically, mathematically, it should be something we call a manifold. And the, uh, when we talk about the tangent space, there's a strong tendency to talk about the tangent space at a point S, say I named that point S, and the tangent space at a point P, because those are totally different tangent spaces. But I want to be able to talk about the tangent space of all space-time, which is the collection of all the tangent spaces sort of together. And because the tangents... Uh, because a vector field is, I go to each tangent space and I pull out one vector. And the sum total of all of those vectors sort of makes up the vector field, which I write down as a mu x del mu, like that. That would be a vector field. And the way I know which, you know, if I'm interested in this point P, well, I plug in the coordinates of point P there, I calculate the components, I know the differential operators, uh, how they act on the coordinate system, because the differential operators are relative to the coordinate system I've chosen, right? And I uh, can calculate the components, so I, get, I end up with a mu at, say, point P, and this is the actual vector that lives in this particular tangent space. But if I want to think about the entire field of them, I think about... Uh, one vector selected from each member of every tangent space. And that's really called a section of a fiber bundle. But, you know, I haven't really gotten into enough to, to explain why that is. But it, you probably can get, you can get there without knowing fiber bundles in great detail and manifolds in great detail. There's a lot of very interesting but slightly distracting math at this point that we're not going to deal with. 
but understand that when I talk about the tangent space, right, the tangent space, I'm really talking about sort of the collective of all the tangent spaces at every point. And when I talk about a vector field or a covector field, I'm talking about going into each of these tangent spaces and pulling out one particular vector, right? And that vector will represent some physical property. It'll be like a magnetic field or an electric field or a force field or a field of density. But in order to get it right, I need to know what these functions are so I can say, oh, the vector representing that particular field at S, you know, I calculate using this function here and I do it at every point. And, and then I can figure out what vector is relevant at every single point. Okay, so that, uh, that covers this material. This is a very important discussion of coordinate transformations and how it induces a change in the change of the basis vectors of the tangent space and the cotangent space. And this is critical because in general relativity, changing coordinates is like changing clothes. It is, happens all the time. It's absolutely critical and it's totally arbitrary. And all physical laws have to be independent of those coordinate transformations. It shouldn't matter what you, how you name and label points in the universe to uh, how the laws of physics work. And that is a heavy, heavy constraint that uh, uh, Einstein discovered called the principle of general covariance that uh, is going to really, really constrain how the laws of nature can look in the real universe. But right now, we've now got the mathematical architecture of all this pretty well established and we understand how these coordinate changes um, will drive changes in our tangent spaces. So now it's a matter of creating physical models that will um, uh, uh, utilize this architecture and predict things in nature. And then the other part is that we have to um, figure out how to connect these tangent spaces with one another. All these tangent spaces are independent vector spaces um, with uh, that are... are disconnected. You can't compare vectors in these different places. So now we have to solve that problem and that'll be the beginning of our next lecture.